So we began by looking at the first thing Huber invented, which was his hay rake, and we moved on to the mostly wood with some metal uh, harvester. And now that we've moved from the harvester into the tractors, we're looking at his all metal machinery. Uh, his early tractors were very, very durable and inexpensive. They were also continually evolving. The first kinds of tractors he made, I, I don't have an example to show you right now, but I can tell you the second kind of tractor he made. There were hundreds of these Huber Model S tractors across America, and not just in the United States. A few years ago, the museum got an email from someone in Sweden saying, we've got this tractor in a barn. <laughs> it says Huber, H-U-B-E-R. We're writing you in case you're the manufacturer. So these machines ended up all over Europe as well. But the Model S is a workhorse that comes in two formats. And each time he created another uh, tractor, he would put new modifications on it. The original ones had started out, for example, with their radiators not facing the wind, but with their radiators being 90 degrees from what you'd expect. And the 90 degree angle radiator not as efficient. By the time they figured that out, um, it went through the crops better. It was more streamlined. But by the time they figured out it's better to have the radiator in the traditional position, it wasn't too long before the hand crank start. And I'll show you a hand crank start in a moment on another machine. But the hand crank start is re replaced after a while with a, an ignition button. And the Model S, though, comes in several variants. You could decide how big an engine you wanted uh, for your soils. If you had clay soil, you'd get a larger engine for more torque, more traction and power. If you were doing row crops, only row crops, you would get a different configuration. Uh, they could manipulate the height of the Huber by the hydraulics they put on it. Um, down below, the leaf springs and such for suspension, and they could manipulate the uh, width of the chassis where the wheels are. So if you were cropping every 20 inches versus they're cropping every 14, and of course these are uh, decisions farmers are still making today. How densely do you want to plant? How, how broadly do you want to space your rows? How much seed do you want to lay down? And the tractors follow the needs of the farmer. Huber was incredibly inventive, however. He never stopped inventing. He owns over 100 patents. And the museum owns one each of all his patent models, which is a remarkable collection, too. So let's look at one of the things he did with the Model S. The Model S frame becomes the Huber Orchard Tractor. And this Huber Orchard Tractor is one of probably only two left in the world because the production run got stifled. We'll talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about how this was changed. It's still the same engine, but it's been lowered. It's still the same wheelbase, but they've uh, made the front a little narrower for a tighter turning radius. After all, if you're going to be in an orchard, you need to make tight turns between the trees without harming the trees. You don't want to have an impact with any tree branches or trunks. And maybe most noticeably, can you see the fairing? This may look like it's been streamlined for aerodynamic style, like, you know, the 50s fins started out of streamlining and became style on all our automobiles in the 1950s. This fairing is actually not for looks, not for streamlined style. This is to protect the trees. If there are branches in your orchard, this fairing moves them gently out of the way. They don't catch any wheels. You don't damage your crop for the next year. And that's why this is more covered in its engine. If you were to compare the Model S, to the, the orchard tractor, you see that the Model S is right out there where you can work on it, maintain it in the field and see at a glance if anything's gone wrong. Whereas it takes a little more work and they had a way to tighten down and close up uh, the orchard tractor so that you weren't so likely to damage your orchard. But they made very few of these, 1935, 1939, because when World War II starts and Pearl Harbor happens, the U.S. government decides to call the shots for the wartime economy. And the War Board determined production. And the War Board told Huber, among other manufacturers of farm equipment, no more tractors. Your job from here on out is to make road building and road maintaining equipment. Except they didn't use them all for roads. Some of their maintainers were used to build airfields. Let's talk next about a maintainer as one of our social histories of an object and what that object can tell us about its past. So here we're talking about a Huber maintainer. A maintainer such as this is that same tractor, but 
if you went smaller and lower and narrower for the orchard tractor for the maintainer, you go with tried and true technology. It's taller, it's broader, and above all else, it's got a massive engine, much more so than was being used for farm equipment needs. But it's also overbuilt. And maintainers like this were used during the war for everything having to do with winning the war, World War II, uh, particularly for airfield construction. But afterward, they became the workhorses, if you'll pardon the pun. They became the workhorses for counties and states, uh, for companies, for contractors, for all kinds of road building that went on post-war as well. So let's talk about why this machine first created at the direction of the U.S. government and not at the Huber Corporation's will. Let's talk about a mach how a machine like this was too excellent. It was too good. This machine essentially helped put the company out of business. Yeah, hard truths, I know. This machine was overbuilt, where you could have had one, two, three welds, and maybe two more point welds. Hewer's company goes ahead and does a weld that's at least twice as thick as it needs to be and goes clear from end to end. No spot welding here. This is absolutely welded on. What's more, they've got a weld here and here and here where most companies would have just done two. And they've got it double bolted. And if you could feel this, the steel, the gauge of the steel, this is much too heavy than it really needed to be. And in fact, later on, Huber's competitors would make machinery that copied his designs, but in thinner gauge steel, uh, with fewer welds, with fewer bolts, with uh, fewer fail safes, you might say, with less insurance. Oh, and by the way, you probably can't see from there, but there's not just this weld out front, there's the matching weld out back. There's not just this triangle of support, there's this other triangle back here. Absolutely unbreakable machinery. So if it doesn't break in 50 years, you don't have to buy another one. Huber doesn't make any money. And the cheaper companies, the knockoff companies, had to replace theirs two, three times in 50 years. Some Hubers are still available. You can still see them out in the wild, so to speak. Uh, they're still working. They don't break. But there was a second way in which the Huber was too smart. And that's the fact that this one machine could do 10 things. Right now, this has the road blader, road grader blade on it. And the road grader blade is one of the things that the maintainer could do. It also has the front loader blade out front, the, the black front loader. And in back, it has a hook ready to tow things. So all of a sudden, you've got three functions on one machine. No longer would a contractor have to buy a front loader and buy a grader. He just buys 10 implements to attach to one machine. And so the competing companies were selling smaller, cheaper, one-off machines. They might get you to buy a machine every other year over 20 years to get 10 different functions. Huber said, buy it once, get all your implements, all your attachments, and they all come on and off really quite easily. And now you can do all these different things. Let me see if I can get all 10 functions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a front loader, it's a back loader, it's a grader, it's a sweeper, it's a mower, it's a, you can tow things with it, I'm not sure what word I want there, but it has a, a, a tow bucket at the back, and there's a couple more besides. But when you have all those different implements attachable to one machine, you don't sell as many. And in fact, Huber's numbers went down toward the end of the career of the company, and in 1986, Sorry to say, Huber ceased to be an American corporation in 1986 when it was bought by a competitor. And the competitor moved the production to North Carolina and wasn't successful there. And eventually sold the name and sold the components and sold the remaining stock. And even finally sold the manufacturing site. No more Huber, 1986. Venture capitalism and the continuing buyout of companies to sell off the parts because the parts were worth more than the whole. So Huber was a massive success from 1863 to 1986, and then it's a victim of its own success by overbuilding, by being too high quality, by being too ingenious, 
by being too flexible, by not thinking of the market so much. And of course, in this period of time, the management of the company changes. The original founder of the company, Ed Huber, dies. His, his uh, family members, to some degree, and also his employees take the company forward. And maybe they didn't have quite the vision of the Ed Huber who could see that an orchard tractor would be a great thing to make. Nonetheless, uh, this gives us one more way of thinking about how technology is never neutral. Technology always has an impact on society. And in this case, as long as there was Huber in Marion, there were millionaires in Marion. There were always jobs in Marion. And when manufacturing leaves, when technology goes, we no longer have that supporting structure for a community. Although, you know, I do want to make one more note about marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Huber was pretty savvy, and they did continue this tradition. Every machine you bought came with a free jack. Now I want to show you this jack. That's a jack. <laughs> you buy a machine, you get the machinery you need to repair it, and if you had to change a tire, well, there you go. 